Hello. Welcome to this City Arts and Lectures program. I'm Preet Bharara. I uh, used to be the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Uh, I now do other things. I teach at NYU Law School as a Distinguished Scholar in Residence. Um, I have two podcasts, one of which is called Stay Tuned with Preet, on which uh, our guest today was a guest of mine on the podcast this week. Uh, and I also wrote a book myself called Doing Justice, A Prosecutor's Thoughts on Crime, uh, Punishment, and the Rule of Law. And um, I'm lucky today to be joined by my friend. We've become pretty good friends over the, over the last couple of years. He gives me advice. He gives the country advice and counsel uh, in his capacity, not only as a, a writer for The New Yorker, not only as an author of eight books, but also as the chief, and he always reminds me of this, he's the chief legal analyst at CNN. Uh, we're here to talk about some current events, but mostly talk about this crowning achievement, this accomplishment by Mr. Tubin. His new book, his eighth book, eighth, right? Is that right? It is eighth, yeah. A lot of books. That's it's a, a lot, lot of books, of Jeffrey. Books. <laughs> True Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Investigation of Donald Trump by, by Jeffrey Tubin. Um, I could go on and on uh, with accolades about you, Jeff. I think we should probably get to the conversation. So we'll talk about the book. We'll talk about the state of the legal union. Um, we'll also have time for your questions in the last, uh, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I think there's a function by which in the chat you can put up questions and they'll be transmitted to me through the miracle of um, modern technology. And I will put your toughest questions to Jeffrey. Are you, are you trying to get a word in already? Yes, I am trying to get a word in. I am already interrupting you, Preet. Um, I just wanted to say how happy I am to be back at City Arts and Lectures. Nobody loves City Arts more, more than I do. I, I have had the privilege of appearing there many times. Um, I have interviewed such celebrities as, as Justice Stephen Breyer and even interviewed Preet Bharara um, right. when, 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 his, when his book came out. So we're, we're switching roles here. And um, I so regret and sorry that I am not there on the stage at the Sydney Goldstein Theater, uh, which is really one of the great performance spaces of the, of the United States. I mean, you know, S Sydney herself did such a magnificent job in transforming um, that former school storage facility into the wonderful facility that it is now. And I'm sorry I'm not there. I'm sorry I'm not in San Francisco. I'm sorry we're all living through this pandemic. But at least I am glad that uh, we are able to um, foster the spirit of City Arts and talk to my buddy Preet, uh, as long as he doesn't ask too hard questions. Give me some math questions. Definitely, <laughs> definitely right. some math questions. I don't know how you did in math, Harvard Law School guy. Not so good. So we're going to go with the math. But later, later in the program, yeah. I echo everything that you said. Um, I have not been there many times. I was there once on the occasion of you interviewing me on the stage. It was, I think, the best experience that I had in my entire book rollout. So I'm also sad that we can't be there. But maybe for your ninth book, we can, oh, we can all, which, which probably will be out in three or four months. Oh, my God. <laughs> given even, given the pace at which, yeah. can I start first just by asking, how, how are you? Are you okay? You know, I'm, I'm great, actually. You know, the, the book uh, it just it was officially published this week. And, uh, you know, it's such a weird experience that um, you, you work on a book uh, for a long time. I mean, I, I, I've been reporting this book, really, since, you know, Mueller was appointed in May of 2017. And, um, and some of it goes back to, you know, my coverage of, of the campaign. But books are, they're kind of like a private experience for a long time. And you know you've read them and you've proof you've edited them and you've worked with your editors and you the fact checkers and, and 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 there's a very tiny circle of people who are aware of what's in the book, and then all of a sudden, if you're lucky, and I feel like I've been lucky, like people start reading the book and people start writing reviews of the book, and it's like wow, you mean like people are actually going to read it and and like talk about it and and you know one of the things that that you know just in this brief period. You know, I have been struck by, and you know, this will come out in our conversation. You know, there, when you write a book, you think, oh, people will be interested in X and Y, but it turns out they're interested in Y and Z, and and, and there are more questions and Q, about or that. sometimes Q, or sometimes Q, <laughs> or, or if you're unlucky, they're not interested at all. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I've been thrilled, frankly. I mean, by the, the we've gotten a number of reviews very quickly. Uh, the reviews have been great. The, the the sales are off to a good start. And uh, it's, 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 it's gratifying, but I, I, I always, and I remember having this feeling before with other books, it's like, 
oh, wow, you mean this isn't just like this thing I do at home and, and struggle to write every day. This is something that's out in the world and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm glad about that. Right, good. Um, before we get to the book, I wanna ask you about something that happened in the news today. Uh-huh. I'm foisting this on you, so if you that haven't followed good. it, no. I'll, 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 I'll allow you know, your pass. But, but I think it's actually a good segue into the subject matter of your book in, in a way. As some of you may have seen this morning, uh, Tish James, who's the Attorney General of the State of New York, announced a civil complaint, a civil enforcement action against the NRA, the National Rifle Association, with maybe the most eye-popping aspect of the complaint that the relief that they seek is the dissolution of the NRA because of all sorts of alleged financial improprieties and everything else. So my question is, first, do you have a reaction to that? And then the reason I ask it at the beginning of this discussion is the Attorney General, Tish James, announced yesterday that there would be an announcement today, but nobody knew what it was. All she said was a press conference on a national matter. And what I found fascinating about that, separate and apart from the substance, is that on Twitter, on social media, and in other places, people kind of lost their minds and assumed that this was the much awaited indictment of Donald Trump. The thing that eluded you know, the Senate, the thing that eluded uh, Bob Mueller, much of what you talk about in your book, this was now gonna happen. So A, do you have a reaction to the, to the lawsuit? And B, what do you think it says about people that, that they're still trying to f find a prosecutorial hero, Bob Mueller, Tish James, someone else, to bring about their fantasy of the removal of Donald Trump? Well, you know, um... I, I was fascinated by the Tish, the, the Tish James announcement and also and, and also the buildup. I guess um, you know on the specifics of the case, you know it, it's it really relates to the laws of charity in New York State. One of the weird things about attorneys general is that in addition to their other su responsibilities, they supervise charities in their state. And frankly, I am not terribly familiar with the law of charities and what it takes to um to to dissolve a charity i did read the complaint and the thing that was just amazing to me about the complaint is what a grift the nra seems turned out to be i mean the way these top executives were living like kings in private planes and renting renting yachts and 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 um uh, you know s s spending money on their families you know i, I just wonder what you know, the NRA's literally millions of contributors will, will feel about how their, their contributions have been used. Um, as for, uh, you know, your, your larger point about, you know, the, the fixation on uh, criminally prosecuting Donald Trump. Um, yeah, I, the, frankly, when you started to ask that question, I thought you were gonna ask me about the Cy Vance investigation. Cy we can talk about that too. <laughs> well, but but that, I mean, that's the uh, Manhattan District. Cy Vance is the Manhattan District Attorney. He went all the way to the Supreme Court in an effort to get um, Donald Trump's tax returns uh, and his financial records, some of the Deutsche Bank records, uh, for part of a, 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 an actual criminal investigation. And um, you know, I, Trump managed to str stretch out this fight so that. Uh, it's quite clear that um, Vance will not get access to these documents uh, in any meaningful way, or perhaps at all, until after the 2020 election. Um, I, I guess I, 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 you know, and this is something that I think you, you and I have in common, and, and, and we've, t we've talked about this, is that, you know, as a former prosecutor, I mean, you were a U.S. attorney, a much higher level. I was just an assistant U.S. attorney. But I am very cautious about ascribing criminal behavior to people. I don't think you know, criminal prosecution should be brought lightly, including against Donald Trump. Um, and you know, this idea, this underlying assumption that there is something criminal in Donald Trump's past, whether in its tax, you know, tax matters or money laundering or, or some other kind of fraud, I've always been, you know, you know, people always say, oh, you know, uh, they're going to find um, all kinds of criminality. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, yes, Donald Trump was obviously a shady businessman of some kind. 
um, you know, he was known for screwing um, contractors and subcontractors. Uh, but, you know, actual criminal behavior, um, you know, we're going to talk about Mueller. But that's provable. Terms, Maybe we'll forget. Well, that, that's right. It also of, has you know, to be provable and has to be provable beyond a reasonable yes. doubt. Yes. And, you know, you, Preet, I mean, we talked about this when, I, when, when, when we were at City Arts and about your book. It's like, well, why didn't they prosecute all those, you know, the head of Lehman Brothers in the, uh, uh, you know, in the 2008 uh, financial collapse? And why, you know, why didn't any of those people go to jail? And, you know, you had to answer that question all the time. And that, you know, I, I related to your answer, which was, you know, in, in effect, there's a lot of bad behavior that's not criminal. And, and I think that applies to Trump as well. But what, just further to that, let's dive into your book and, and some of the analysis you do, not just about the players in connection with the Russia investigation and impeachment, but also public perception of them and how they took up, you know, residence in the minds of a lot of Americans for good or for ill. We'll talk about for the good for a moment. What do you think the public's perception was of Robert Mueller, <clears throat> given what people like you and I and others, and I knew him fairly well, said about him? And how did that perception change over time? And was there something unhealthy about the expectations people had for this former Marine, Robert Mueller? Um, you know, um, uh, the the the... the the, 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 one of the many interesting things about Robert Mueller and his investigation here was the evolution of of of, of feelings uh, about him. I, I apologize that there's a siren. Uh, I believe it's a fire truck going by my apartment. Presumably, it should be going by very shortly. Um, the um, you know Robert Mueller. Wow, he's like right going by now. Do you want to check your kitchen? Are no, you no, okay? it's, no, it's okay. It was, uh, there, <laughs> there he goes, or, or she. Um, the, um, you know, Mueller um, is, was not just old, but he was old school. You know, Mueller came from a tradition where prosecutors were really independent of the, the political process to the extent humanly possible. Plus, he came from a tradition where prosecutors said little except in the courtroom. They did not, um, th 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 you know, he, he, you know, one of the things that I, you know, learned quickly about Mueller as I began my reporting is that he couldn't stand the Starr investigation uh, because it went on for so long. There were so many leaks. Uh, Starr held all those press conferences talking about his investigation. Mueller was determined not to do that. Um, when Mueller was appointed in May of 2017, um, one of the things that was so striking is that he was one of the very few people in Washington, contemporary Washington, who was widely perceived as apolitical. It's the, the list of people who are genuinely regarded that way is, is almost, uh, it, it almost limited to him, or it was. And in many respects, the, the story of the Mueller investigation was the fixation of the left and the right of their fantasies and nightmares on, on, uh, on Mueller. On the left, you had you know, the, the world of MSNBC, where they were convinced that Mueller was going to be the avenging angel who brought down Robert, who, who, bought, to, who brought down Donald Trump. You know, the, the, and that's where you got the Mueller time T-shirts and the Robert Mueller action figures. And Rudolph Giuliani, uh, in a very calculated effort from the right, set out to demonize Mueller as just another Democrat out to get Trump. And what you saw over the course of the two plus years of the Mueller investigation was the polarization affecting his own reputation. He became a figure of love and veneration on the left and a figure of contempt on the right, even though Mueller himself never changed. And, and I thought that was a good illustration of sort of how, how um, the media and how our politics works today, uh, because we are in such a polarized environment that, that to see someone who was, I think, genuinely independent of politics, is almost impossible. And, and he was seized on by the left and the right to serve their own purposes. He was so apolitical, and I've said this many times to remind folks, 
He was the FBI director for the statutorily limited time of 10 years, went through the whole term, started just a few days after, <clears throat> a few days before 9-11. And then when President Obama had to pick a new FBI director, rather than choose from the 30, 330 million other people in the country, they did something that is almost impossible to do. They changed the law on a bipartisan basis to allow Bob Mueller to serve another two years. So, you know, the evolution of thinking about him has been extraordinary. And you say that on the left, there's a particular perception. One might think that that's no longer the case that he's venerated by the left because of, you know, some people thinking that he fell short. In the Mueller report, you make some of these points. Some of these right, points but, also. But, but very importantly, at least it's my goal. You know, my, my goal in, in you know, per, per, I mean, my, both, my book is mostly a narrative. I mean, it's mostly the story of the investigation and then the, the, the Ukraine congressional investigation. So it's not, you know, it's not like an, a one long op-ed piece of you know, scolding or praising Robert Mueller. It's mostly the story of how this investigation unfolded. But in terms of my criticisms of Mueller, and I obviously I do have some, my criticism, I mean, my goal in criticizing him was not like, well, you didn't get, you didn't get Donald Trump, so you failed. No, my, my, my criticisms of him are on his own terms, are on, you know, what a prosecutor, what a good prosecutor should do. That's how, I, you know, I criticize him for failing on those grounds. Now, I, I, maybe I'm wrong and maybe these criticisms are unfair, but it, my criticisms of Mueller is not simply for the result he achieved, it's the process uh, that he used to, um, to get there. Going back to what you were talking about a second ago, his being not just old, but old school, and part of that tradition is to keep your mouth shut. I mean, I think as you have said, something fairly remarkable to the ears of a lot of people who think that everyone leaks all the time, that, um, and then you know, tell me if I'm right about this, because you say it in your book, the Mueller team didn't leak. They kept their mouths shut. And Bob Mueller himself made almost no public comments at all. Is that an area on which he should be criticized? So for example, when members of his team were attacked as partisan and terrible in various ways, up to and including the President of the United States, would the better practice for him have been, a better approach for him, would it have been to say something and defend his people, defend his investigation, or would it not have mattered? Well, um, let me, uh, uh, let, you know, I mean, first of all, just your larger point that, you know, that, that Trump didn't, that, that Mueller and his staff didn't leak. I mean, they really didn't leak. And they had um, the best investigative journalists in the country, very much not including me. I mean, they, like the, the people who do nothing but investigative journalism um, pounding at that door for, for two years and they got nothing. And that and and that was really pretty pretty extraordinary, um, and and you know again not to make everything about me, uh, but I you know here I was you know writing this book uh, allegedly about the Mueller investigation, and for two years I had nothing other than you know what the public had because they wouldn't talk to me. Now fortunately after they shut down I did I I got. I think great access to the Mueller investigation, the, the people in, involved, and I was able to tell um, to tell their story. But um, it was um, a sealed up office. Now, your question is: Is that the right way to conduct an investigation? You know, with utterly no uh, contact uh, with the press. You know, I think that's a tough call. I mean, I did have a perverse admiration for um, the the discipline that Mueller and his team showed. Um, I, I, all, I, I do think it had some cost. And, and you know, when Giuliani um, was demonizing both Mueller and his staff, um, um, I think many prosecutors, even good rule following prosecutors, would have stepped up and defended, and, and defended their staff. You know, given the polarized environment, I'm not sure it would have made uh, much difference. I mean, one of the um, you know sad facts about our our current uh, political world, and 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 you know, I don't think this is an equal an equal problem on the left and the right. I think it's mostly a problem on the right that there is you know the the Fox News universe, which is impervious to facts, and all you only need to listen to the president talk about COVID to know that I mean you know th that he and his circle 
don't deal in facts. And so the fact that Mueller, you know, could have responded, I doubt that would have penetrated the Fox News bubble. But I, I think there were good prosecutors uh, who would have uh, spoken up in response. I mean, part, of, part of my analysis of that has been, yeah, you speak up once. Um, Mueller was not going to engage in a daily war room type approach. And so fine, he speaks up a couple of times. The president's going to tweet 400 times about that. Right. And Rudy Giuliani is going to talk about that on Fox News and in other places. So in some ways, I still think that maybe he was in a, not in a very good position to sort of deal with the publicity aspects of it and the criticism because he was never going to do it on a regular basis. And to do it a couple of times was just going to invite even more blowback from Trump and others. But I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you, you, I mean, it's certainly like, it, it, you know, Sean Hannity would not have listened to what Robert Mueller and said and said, oh, you know, you have a point there. No, I mean, that, <laughs> you that, changed my not, mind. <laughs> that's not that's not how that world works. But I mean, there is sometimes value in in yeah. in, in speaking up and defending and, and defending your people. Even John Roberts. Right. It's a similar sort of situation. I, I sort of it is similar. Have equated them. You know, John Roberts was quiet for a long time when judges in the United States were criticized, sometimes by name. And John Roberts put out one statement one time, there are no Obama judges, there are no Trump judges. And, you know, he had his one shot. And then Trump tweets and then the other people say their things. And then, then John Roberts goes back into silence mode, just like Bob Mueller would have had to do. So it was kind of a no-win situation. We could talk about Mueller the whole time. Okay. But what, I, what I think is interesting about your book, and I want you to tell the audience um, about some of this, there are a lot of personalities. There are a lot of really smart, intelligent, thoughtful people, characters, and you do more than anyone else has done before because people were focusing on the reporting. But stories are made up of actions of people who have particular characters and personalities, and you bring a lot of them to life. Tell folks a little bit about some of the interesting characters whose names were not household names that you write about and why they should care about them. Well, I mean, let, let me get, get mention two prosecutors uh, on Mueller's staff, uh, one of whom got some publicity, uh, one of whom... I don't think name ever appeared in the newspaper uh, or, or in the internet during, um, during this investigation. And that's Je Jeannie Ree and Andrew Weissman. Um, Jeannie Ree um, is really a fascinating woman. Um, she, she was born in, in Seoul, uh, Korea. Her parents uh, emigrated to the United States, um, not, didn't have much money. Um, they, uh, uh, they, they, their family ran a Japanese restaurant. They're Korean, but they ran a Japanese restaurant um, outside Pittsburgh for a while. They moved to California. Her father uh, bought a gas station. Um, but, you know, she went to Yale, went to Yale Law School, incredibly successful student, clerked, uh, worked as an assistant district uh, U.S. attorney in Washington, served in the Justice Department, um, and then became a partner at the Wilmer Hale firm, where she um, um, worked with uh, Robert Mueller on the uh, Ray Rice investigation. I don't know how many people remember the Ray Rice investigation, but Ray Rice was a uh, football player, uh, a, very, a, a very successful running back for the Baltimore Ravens, who was uh, involved in, in a terrible domestic violence incident uh, where, he, where he hit his wife in an elevator, which was, and it was on video. And the NFL hired Mueller to do an investigation, and Ginny Ree um, w worked on that investigation with Mueller. Um, she was named the head of the Russia investigation for Mueller. Mueller said, you're the person to find out what happened in, um, in the, uh, you know, in terms of the, the collusion side of things. You know, what did Russia do to help, um, to help um, Trump get elected president. And let me just give you one story of like, you know, what it's like to conduct an investigation like this. And this to me was, was I thought, a really remarkable story. Now, one of the young lawyers who was on Jeannie, Jeannie Rhee's team was a guy named Rush Atkinson. He was a, a DOJ lawyer. He, he worked for the Department of Justice. He was uh, sent over to work for, for Mueller. And one of his responsibilities was to investigate the hack. And, uh, you know, how the Russian military, um, uh, the military intelligence got access first 
to the uh, Democratic National Committee emails, and then later John Podesta's emails. John Podesta was Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman. And, um, you know, one night, late at night at the, uh, at the, um, the, the, the uh, Mueller offices in an office building uh, that, was, that was literally called Patriots Plaza. I love the fact that Mueller's offices were called Patriots Plaza. <laughs> he, uh, did, he, didn't, he inherited that name, right? He, he inherited didn't, that name. He didn't, he didn't choose those the name. Okay, yes, okay. right. But that's, that's, that's what their name. And anyway, one night, um, uh, Rush Atkinson is going over the hacking and he sees one day in July of 2016, that the hacking spikes, that there's like more hacking and they're hacking more uh, emails, uh, more email accounts affiliated with the Hillary Clinton campaign. He says like, look, well, why this day? Why, why this spike? And so he just sort of Googles, you know, like the date. And I believe, I'm not gonna get the date right. So it was July, but it was July of 2016. And he sees that on this day, in the morning, interestingly, in the morning, um, Donald Trump has a press conference at Mar-a-Lago in Florida. And that's the day that Trump says, Russia, if you're listening, go find Hillary Clinton's emails. I think you'll be rewarded by our press. Right. And Rush can't believe this. He's thinking, could it be that this is what caused it? And so he calls in Jeannie Ree and they start working with time zones. They start looking at, is, did the statement that Trump made take place genuinely before Russia started this, this, this extended hacking? And it turns out there was about a two or three hour lag between Trump's statement and when they ramped up the uh, when they ramped up the uh, the hacking, I mean, think about what that discovery meant. I mean, I, it just it gives. Well, me so does guilt. that mean? Does that mean, Mr. Tubin, that there was collusion? Well, but see, that's the thing. You know, it, it, like just because to a layperson, you know, it looks like it looks that way, right? Well, and 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 it it's it's you know you know B follows A does not mean that A caused B. Um, so. You know, can could can I prove? Can could Jeannie Ree and and uh, uh, Rush Atkinson prove that Russia actually responded to Trump's command? Can can anyone prove that Trump knew what he was saying? And and I mean, even uh, if they did respond to the command, it's very difficult to show that the person saying the thing was cooperating with the other official, conspiring with the other folks, right? Who, who right. will rid me this meddlesome priest? Exactly. Is the what, literary and, analogy, right? Well, and, and um, you know, it, it, putting aside the question of whether collusion is a crime, but collusion or conspiracy takes a meeting of the mind in, in order to prove that, um, th th that there was some sort of joint action you'd have to prove more than Donald Trump said something and Russia responded to it, you know, through the news media. What you'd have to prove is that there was some agreement between the two of them um, that, um, that, th that, this, that this action was, was something that they both wanted to have happen. So yes, it, th this is not dispositive proof that there was any collusion. In fact, it's, it's, it's not proof at all, but it's awfully damn interesting, I think. Well, it's it's, and, and, it's and, possibly more than interesting, right? Right. Well, and, and, people... and, and of course, the, 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 what, what Mueller, you know, they had this incredible intelligence apparatus where they could see what was being typed on the Russian computers. But of course, they did not have access to the actual Russians who were doing the typing. Okay. And th so they couldn't prove, you know, they couldn't ask them, well, did you have any contact with the Trump campaign? And in fairness, it needs to be pointed out that there was never any proof, particularly at least when it comes to hacking, that there was any sort of meeting of the minds between members of the Trump campaign and, uh, and the Russians. Now, 
One area that they did investigate very carefully was whether Roger Stone, who was a, um, you know, a sort of hanger on, sometimes advisor to the Trump campaign, whether he reached out to WikiLeaks, who received the, uh, the, the stolen emails from, from Russia and then released them, was he the intermediary? Um, the, the short answer is uh, the Mueller people could never prove it. Uh, they certainly had suspicions, but uh, Stone denied um, that he was an intermediary and, and the, the, the Mueller people never, never proved it. Part of what you're describing, I think, makes the point that the law has limitations, that there can be bad conduct, terrible conduct, that is not conspiracy, that is not coordination, um, and that there should be perhaps other ways of holding someone accountable. And that didn't happen here either. And so I want to I want to segue into the other thing that made this book difficult for you, as you've discussed. You begin writing about the Russia investigation, the Russia probe. That sort of ends with a fizzle. I think it's a fair characterization. Yes. And immediately we have the situation with Ukraine. So my first question is, how, how difficult was that for you in the writing of the book? And then my second question is, which thing was worse in terms of conduct, whether it's illegal or not? Was it the, the business with Russia and what the Mueller investigation uncovered, or was it the business with Ukraine and what Congress uncovered? Wow. Um, that, that's a, the, well, 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 first of all, let's talk about me because that's so interesting. <laughs> it's uh, your night. It's your night. <laughs> no, it's your it, night, it's, sir. I mean, was it, was it problematic for me? It was incredibly problematic. I mean, I thought I was writing a book about the Mueller investigation. Now, it, 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 I mean, as, as, as a journalist and, and as a citizen, you know, I couldn't help but be interested in, in finding out, you know, what happened in this next chapter. And as it turned out, um, and we'll get to this, you know, I, I think they are far more one story than two stories. You know, the, the Russia story and the Ukraine story, if you look at the, the cast of characters and the nature of the behavior, it's really much more one story than two. But certainly- I remember we, running into you, just on a personal note, I remember running into you in the, hall, in the hallways at CNN when this new thing was happening and having just come off of writing my own book, I kept, I think I was asking you every time I saw you, how are you, how are you processing the new stuff? I, I mean, it, 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 with difficulty was, yeah. was, the, was, the, was the answer. But, but just to get to your, your question of which is worse, because this is something I thought a lot about. And, and um, you know, again, just to, 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 an, another part that perhaps we'll discuss is, you know, I think, it is without question clear that Trump committed the crime of obstruction of justice uh, when it comes to his interactions with James Comey and his, his um, interactions with his White House counsel, Don McGahn. Uh, and I think one of Mueller's two big failures, the failure to subpoena Trump, and the other failure was, was, was Mueller's failure to state clearly and emphatically that Trump did commit the crime of obstruction of justice. Um, so, so that's bad. But in many respects, I think what Trump did with regard to Ukraine was worse. Uh, because, uh, and, and this really gets to the heart of why we have uh, impeachment in the Constitution. Be, and, and because, you know, the, 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 the famous and mysterious phrase uh, in the Constitution, high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, it has been one of the most fraught debates um, at least since 1868 in the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. It's not true what crimes is, and misdemeanors? Well, yeah, that, that perhaps that's, that will- That's be, the book title. That, that, that's, that's will, and, and obviously, you know, I'm playing on that, but, but, you know, what constitutes a high crime and misdemeanor is something that is, that has been debated in, in, a, in, a, in American law and American politics for, for generations. And, and I think the best answer comes from Alexander Hamilton in the, in the Federalist Papers, um, where he says, you know, what we are concerned about, the reason why we put in an impeachment provision is we needed some, some um, mechanism to prevent the abuse of power by a president. Um, the, 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 that, that's what impeachment is really about. It's not about the criminal law. First of all, in the early 18th century, 
there really was no federal criminal law yet. Uh, so the idea that high crimes and misdemeanors had to be actual crimes, you know, prohibited by the, you know, Title 18 of the United States Code is completely false because there was no, there was no Title 18 or any other title of the United States Code. What they were concerned about was abuse of power. And if you look at what Donald Trump did with regard to Ukraine, it was a classic abuse of power. Because you know the, the United States has lots of interests in Ukraine in terms of relationships with Russia, the European Union. Trump put aside all of those concerns and only dealt with Ukraine as a vehicle to get himself reelected. And that was a classic abuse of power, including using the cudgel of military aid, which was, which was appropriated by Congress. So to put it another way, Pre, you and I could commit all sorts of crimes. We could commit extortion, we could commit bribery, we could commit obstruction of justice, but you and I could not abuse the powers of the presidency. Only the president could do that. And that's why there is impeachment. And that's why I think Congress was right to put in Article I of, 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 uh, of, of, of impeachment not that Trump committed some crime, because I don't think he did with regard to Ukraine, but what he did was abuse the powers of the presidency. And I think that fundamentally is worse than a garden variety federal criminal offense. Do you think, since you've been around a bit and you've written about the prior impeachment as well, we went a lot of years, a hundred some odd years without impeachment uh, in this country, and then we seem to have this kind of thing looming or happening every 30 years or so, 25 or 30 years. Do you expect that there's been a loosening of the standard under which the House will act and the Senate will have a trial going forward? Well, that's a, I mean, that, that, that's a great question. And Republicans, you know, not without some reason, um, you know, raise that argument. It's like, is this going to become a routine part of, uh, you know, the, the, what Congress does. It, 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 is it going to be every time we have a uh, House of Representatives under control of the opposition party, uh, that, that that's, they're going to wind up use, I, 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 impeaching him? And, you know, I, I, it happened under Nixon. Uh, you had a Democratic House impeaching Nixon. You had a Republican House impeaching, um, I impeaching um, um, Bill Clinton, and now you had a Democratic House impeaching uh, Donald Trump. And you know, I, I, I had a very interesting interview with Nancy Pelosi uh, uh, about this, and it, and it was I, I was really struck by her passion on this subject. Uh, she says, you know, and she told me I, I didn't even remember this. She says, you know, when I was Speaker and George W. Bush was President. Um, there were members of the House who wanted me to impeach Bush because of the Iraq war. And he says, I don't think that's what it's for. And if you recall, and this is, and I tell this story in the book. Um, oh, yeah, she was very Pelosi against it. She was very skeptical yeah. <laughs> of impeachment and, and yeah. you know, was, was, was angry at Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, because he, she thought he was pushing too hard for impeachment. And this was before, um, th this was before, um, um, uh, the, the Ukraine story really hit. And, and just, I mean, again, the, these stories are always about human beings. And one of my favorite stories in, 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 in the book is about what switched Nancy Pelosi. And it was really one thing in particular. Um, you know, Pelosi is a deeply political person, as you know. She, she is probably the, I, I believe her district includes uh, City Arts and Lectures. Um, she um, um, always wants to protect her majority, which means protecting the Democrats who are elected in marginal seats, you know, in the Trump districts, including, you know, many who were elected in 2018. And after the Ukraine story broke, there was a group of five newly elected uh, Democrats, all in districts that Trump won, uh, all of whom had uh, military backgrounds. And, and you know, one, one of them was a congresswoman named uh, Spanberg, uh, Spanberger, Spanbeg, oh God, I'm getting it wrong, in, in Allison Spanbengler, I believe her name is, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. 
Jason Crow in Colorado, um, another, another woman from Michigan. They all had either worked for, they'd been in the military or the CIA. And one weekend, when the story broke, they, they had a sort of Google chat and they said, you know what, we can't put up with this. Th this is just intolerable. And they wrote an op-ed piece uh, together uh, over that weekend. And they published it in the Washington Post. And on Monday, and the next day, on the Tuesday, Nancy Pelosi said, we're gonna go ahead with impeachment. And it was these five, freshman congressmen, these five first-term congressmen and women, whose conscience bothered them so much that they were willing to risk their seats to come out for impeachment. And it was their courage that pushed Nancy Pelosi to go forward. And I just thought that was a, 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 both a revealing and a, and a kind of inspiring story about politics. Look, the way I thought about this for a long time is the impeachment only happened in part because the earlier Russia investigation happened. It's like the judge who decides to give a defendant a little bit of a break and says, you know what? It's not the most serious crime in the world. I'm going to give you a break. And then gives that person probation and the person goes out and the next day, the next day commits a crime, violates probation. They come back in, you hammer that person. And one fact that you haven't mentioned, but we've talked about it and you, and you talked about it in the book is that it, the call with Ukraine, where the abuse of power that you mentioned that you mentioned occurs in its most raw form, was literally the day after yeah. the kind of you know fizzling appearance on Capitol Hill by Robert Mueller. So I don't I, think I mean, that the second thing could have happened at the first thing. Uh, absolutely, and and you know the, the the proximity of those two days, you know, July twenty fourth, Mueller's testimony; July twenty fifth, the phone call between Trump and Zelensky. Uh, I mean, if you put it in a movie, people would say, oh, come on, it's like a little too pat. Well, this whole thing, yeah, the whole country is, has been subject to terrible script writers. Yeah, no, I mean, the it's, last, and, and, <laughs> and the, last the, couple the years. only point I would make in addition about the phone call the, to Zelensky, um, the phone call was so egregious and so obviously inappropriate that Trump, in his bizarre way, was able to fixate on the phone call and say, well, the phone call was perfect and the whole impeachment is all just about this one phone call. You can't impeach someone over one phone call. Right. It's not just one phone call. Yeah. It was an entire pattern of conduct. You know, Zelensky gets elected in April. Uh, I mean, I, again, I, I, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but this is why it's important to, you know, to tell the full story. You know, Paul Manafort was very tied in to the pro-Russia faction of, uh, uh, in, in Ukrainian politics. And it was through Manafort's connections that Rudy Giuliani and his lunatic and bizarre assistants, Zev and Igor, go over and start um, right. you know, in, you know, <laughs> urging an investigation of the Hunter Biden story. But in April of 2016, Zelensky somewhat unexpectedly wins the election and he's part of the pro-West faction and Giuliani has no contacts with that group. So it's a whole new group and Giuliani is essentially right. sidelined after the election of Zelensky. So what happens then is that Giuliani is out more or less as the leader of the Ukraine initiative and Trump himself takes over. So it's not just the July 25th phone call. It's a oh, whole of pattern not. of activity. That's why he's impeached, not just because of the July 25th phone call. So we have a lot of great questions that I'm seeing on the uh -huh. side. I want to ask you one final question before we go to, to the uh -huh. audience questions. And, and it's an it's a easy, easy one. What on earth should people make of John Roberts, Chief Justice? You're one of the best observers of the, and, and writers about the Supreme Court. Make your answer both comprehensive and short. <laughs> Is that an instruction from you or the, uh, the questioner? From me, uh, because I want to okay. get to these other okay. questions, but okay. I, I, right. we, I couldn't let the hour pass without, okay. without your opining a little bit on okay. you know, where is John Roberts coming from? What does it mean? What should people think? Four cases this year. The, 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 four votes that John Roberts cast this year. 
He voted to strike down the, the uh, abortion restrictions of Louisiana. He voted to um, say that Title VII, the federal anti-discrimination law, covered discrimination against LGBTQ people. He, um, he, he voted to overturn um, the Trump administration effort to put a citizenship question on the, uh, on the census. And he um, uh, overturned the Trump effort to undo Barack Obama's protection of the dreamers. Uh, the DACA, the DACA. So he's part of the resistance now? No, but oh. John Roberts okay. has changed. Something has gone on there. There are a lot of people who are saying, oh, no, no, this is consistent with Roberts' ju prior jurisprudence. I don't buy it. I think John Roberts has looked into the heart of the modern Republican Party, his modern Republic, his Republican Party, and recoiled. He is not going to be uh, Donald Trump's handmaiden. And, and I think um, that is a big deal and it's a change. I mean, the people who say, oh, Roberts is just being consistent with his prior beliefs, I just, I, I just don't buy it. I think Roberts, you know, I don't think Roberts has become a never Trumper. I don't think he has become Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I, I think he is still fundamentally a conservative, but I do think Roberts has decided that there are areas in which this administration has simply gone too far and uh, he's voted that way. Yeah, no, I, I think there's, there's a good argument for that. Let's go to some of these questions. Here are two questions that are related to each other that I'll put to you. Uh, <laughs> I get asked this question all the time, so I'm glad I get to put you on, this, on, the, uh -huh. on the spot. The two questions are, will Trump completely escape justice or will there be some hope for the future? And then relatedly, another version of the question is, what are your thoughts on the new DOJ under Biden pursuing charges against Trump after the election? You have said that you believe that book two, volume two of the Mueller report sets forth actual crimes. Should something happen with respect to those things? And will something happen with respect to those things? Um, well, I mean, as we discussed at the beginning of this conversation, you know, there, there is an active criminal investigation of, of, of the Trump organization and presumably Trump himself uh, by the Manhattan uh, District Attorney, which is under, um, you know, state law, not, not, uh, not federal. Um, you know, um, I, I, I do think, you know, people need to be cautious about ascribing criminal behavior to Donald Trump. Uh, let's, we're gonna, let's put a pin in the issue of obstruction of justice for a minute. But other than that, you know, I, I am sure you have heard many times, um, as, as, as I have, it's like, oh, you know, they got to get his tax returns and show he committed tax fraud and show he committed money laundering and show, um, you know, that he was engaged in all sorts of fraudulent activities of the yeah. Trump organization. I don't know that the tax returns are the holy grail. People have been talking about them I, for years. I don't think they're they often did. very inconclusive. Absolutely. And they were prepared by, you know, respectable accountants. Uh, I mean, you know, and, and, and the Deutsche Bank records, who knows, you know, what, what, you know, the, so, so uh, you know, everybody, you know, all my liberal friends uh, are, are in favor of criminal justice reform and we shouldn't over criminalize things and we shouldn't prosecute things that, that, you know, that, that, that don't belong. Except in, in certain criminal. categories. It, right. Except if it's Donald Trump and the hell with all those rules. You know, I, I, I you know, just as, you know, we, we, where we're, we, we talked about, um, you know, the questions you got about the post-2008, um, you know, financial collapse, absence of prosecutions, you know, there is a lot of questionable conduct that does not get prosecuted. Um, so I, I am not aware of criminal cases that need to be brought against Donald Trump. Now, it is true, as I said, um, that I believe Mueller did prove obstruction of justice. Um, I cannot believe that a Biden Justice Department, should one exist, will pursue a case. I, I just think, um, you know, p political, uh, I mean- the, the, is, the, that, is, that, is that sort of in the, in the Gerald Ford philosophy of we should move on? I mean, there's a lot of criticism yes. of the Obama administration for not bringing criminal cases more aggressively against Bush officials insofar uh, as they engage in enhanced interrogation techniques you think the same thing 
will happen or should happen? Yeah, well, I certainly did not think Gerald Ford should have pardoned uh, Richard Nixon, but I'm, uh, but but there is an uh, there there is some value in um, moving on to to use your phrase, and I mean just just imagine. Um, how um, a criminal prosecution of Donald Trump would paralyze a Biden administration in terms of public attention, in terms of uh, you know efforts to motivate the public. I mean, there there is there could be no bigger story than that, and I don't think that's a story Joe Biden wants to have dominate his presidency. So I would say the chances of a Biden Justice Department uh, bringing that obstruction of justice case are are slim to none. Uh, but but I don't rule out some sort of prosecution in the in the uh, in the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation if there if there's a case to be made and I don't know that there is. So this is kind of related to that, and it goes to your theme uh, that just because people behave badly and are negligent and don't do their jobs properly, and bad consequences flow from that, doesn't mean there's a crime. So if someone asks the question: Do either of you foresee any criminal charges against anyone? in the administration for the response to COVID? Same thought? Uh, you know, s s same thought again. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, I haven't followed COVID as, as closely as, you know, I followed the Mueller investigation, but certainly nothing I've seen leaps out to me um, as, as a criminal offense. As, as criminal, right? Right, right. But, but Incompetence, this negligence. Elections. Abuse of power. These things. These things are not necessarily violations of criminal statutes. Absolutely, and and this is why we have elections. There is a very simple and straightforward form of accountability that Donald Trump can face for COVID, and certainly Joe Biden is trying to make this this pre, this this race a referendum on the the president's conduct of of the uh, of the, the the COVID response, and that's entirely appropriate. I don't think it, it is a uh, it, it, it's it's a place for the criminal law based at least on the evidence I've seen. So uh, here's a question: um, What do you make of Barr's in, quote unquote in quotes investigation into the Russia investigation? And let me add my own question there. Um, well, this person also asked: Will they indict someone from the Obama administration? And let me add my own question, which is: Do you think that? people are concerned about the timing of either a report or some other enforcement action uh, that Barr doesn't mind having an announcement of, of some malfeasance that they have conjured up or that they think they can, they can prove against a member of the Obama administration on the eve of the election? How do you think that's going to play out? Well, I, I, I mean, Barr all but said uh, when he testified last week before, before Congress that he will release um, the investigation of um, the uh, the Durham report, you know, the, the the Connecticut U.S. attorney, he's assigned to investigate the roots of the uh, the, the roots of the Russia investigation. He's going to do that before the election. Uh, I mean, this leads to the whole subject of, of Barr, which you know, I, I have to say, I believe a real journalistic failure on my own part and and the news media in general. Um, how little we saw coming what an appalling uh, political actor uh, William Barr has turned out to be. You know, I think he, he suffered, or he, he received a sort of innocence by association. The fact that he was attorney general under George Herbert Walker Bush in, in a different Republican era, uh, cast a glow that, that um, diverted our attention from Barr's really extreme views of presidential power. But then, to see how um, he has abused the power of, of, of the Justice Department, you know, moving to reduce the sentence of, of um, uh, Roger Stone. The only defendant out of all the people prosecuted by the Justice Department under, under uh, William Barr, the only one his case he intervened on to get a lower sentence. Even more extraordinarily, to move to uh, with to overturn the the conviction Michael of Flynn. Ma Michael Flynn who pleaded guilty uh, and, and pre Twice. I mean, this is a qu let, let me ask you actually let me ask you a question because this is something I've been wondering about two things one have you ever heard of the Justice Department ever trying to undo a guilty plea 
And second, you know, one of the things Barr has done is he keeps appointing his favorite U.S. attorneys to conduct sort of side investigations of the Flynn case, of the FBI case, of the Roger Stone case. When, when you were U.S. attorney on, under, in, in the Obama administration, were, were U.S. attorneys given these sorts of projects? No, I, I, I've not seen that before. There's a thing, there's a human called the inspector general. Right. And, if, and you also had other offices that dealt with ethics issues, like, like the Office of, Personal, of Professional Responsibility. And if you thought there was something bad that happened, you look to those agencies within the department who had tons of experience in examining the conduct, behavior, uh, and decision-making of other components within the department. That's what you did. It, if I had been called by uh, you know, the Attorney General Holder or Loretta Lynch when I was U.S. Attorney and said, can you take a hard look at a decision that from the outside looks like it was perfectly you know, competently made and ethically made of your colleague or your former colleague in District X, I don't know that I would have taken the assignment. It's, it's a very weird thing to do when you have other channels for doing that kind of thing. And he's done it over and over again. How about the issue of uh, moving to overturn a conviction where there's a guilty plea? Have you ever seen that? No, I've never, I've, no, I've never seen, and I've never seen it in the context that, that that case has, where you had not only a guilty plea, you had a second guilty plea, you had incredibly competent counsel, you had all sorts of reasons why the conduct was bad at that high level. And you also, the other thing I don't understand is even if you personally think as the attorney general or someone high up in the Justice Department, you know, I wouldn't have decided it that way. I wouldn't have gone that route. The idea that you're going to interpose yourself and intervene, the only time you do so, when it's an associate or friend of Donald Trump, you don't, you don't do that. I mean, there's a reason why appearances, I mean, these people don't care about appearances. Sometimes it's an appearance of, of conflict, some type of impropriety, sometimes it's actual impropriety. Bill Barr doesn't seem to care about the appearance at all. He's old, he's done. It's his last public service job of any, of any prominence probably. And he's like, you know what, I'm gonna reach in and I'm gonna help the, the, the friends of the president and I don't care how it looks. I, that certainly this appears to be the case. Let's do a fun, a fun this yeah. is a fun question. And this person doesn't I specify. They're, they're, all, they're all fun questions. They're all fun, they're all fun. But here's, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to put on your prognostication hat. Uh, and someone asked the question, who is on the short list for any Supreme Court vacancy? Now they, this person doesn't ask it this way, but let's assume it's a Biden administration. Who are the, who are the people by name, Jeffrey, and or what is the profile of the person that a Biden administration would want to put on, onto the Supreme Court? Well, I mean, the, the, the Biden has already said he's going to put a black woman on the court. Um, there, there's never been one. And, and so um, I think um, there think are be his first, You think that'll be his first, his first pick, his first oh, absolutely. Uh, opportunity? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think there are two um, leading candidates already. Uh, one of them uh, works um, about, I don't know, five blocks from uh, the, the, the Sidney Goldstein Theater. Um, that's Leander Kruger, who is a justice of the California Supreme Court, um, who Jerry Brown appointed at a, um, at a very young age uh, to the California Supreme Court. She served in the Obama Justice Department. Uh, she clerked for, I believe, John Paul Stevens. Um, um, uh, she's someone I've met, and um, you know, she, she has a she has a wonderful reputation. She is not um, she is not known as a fire breathing liberal, which I think may uh, uh, may disappoint some uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the the Democrats who want a, a, a real a liberal counterpoint. But I think, but she, I believe she's only forty four years old even now. Um, and that's obviously a, a big factor. The other one is uh, a judge named Katanji Jackson um, in the federal district court in Washington, uh, also an African-American woman um, who clerked for Stephen Breyer and was appointed to the district court uh, by President Obama. Um, so I think those two, uh, the, uh, uh, 
are, are a very uh, are, are are leading candidates to go beyond because um, I, I have to assume that um, if President Biden is elected, you know both Ruth Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer, Stephen Breyer of San Francisco, California, um, will will leave while while Biden is uh, is. Is is president, and I think another justice of the California Supreme Court, uh, named Tino Cuellar, who is a uh, former professor at Stanford Law School, also appointed to the California Supreme Court by Jerry Brown, uh, would be a very serious candidate uh, for that vacancy um, uh, as well. Um, so um, I, th- th- there are a lot of people in the in the in the uh, sort of democratic legal world. Um, uh, very, very hopeful about the idea that that a President Biden would have the chance to fill some seats on the Supreme Court. We've got to end in a moment, but I wanted to, as a point of personal privilege, ask you the final question before we say good night to everyone. We've got an election coming up, and no one knows what's going to happen. And the polls say one thing, and they can change. And the president has laid a foundation for not accepting the results. We may not have a clear victor on the day of the election. How likely do you think we are gonna be heading into a court argument in the fall about who the next president of the United States is? Well, um, you know, after the, uh, the 2016 election, um, I, I have uh, tried to retire from the prediction business, uh, given how wrong <laughs> I was uh, about that one. Uh, well, but a lot of us, a lot of us were. I, I, a lot of us were, but I was, I would say, more wrong than most. And um, I, I, the, the one, so the, the one thing I, I do think people really need to prepare themselves for is um, no resolution on election night. Now, whether there is a meaningful court fight, um, that I'm, I'm less sure of. But, you know, I, I just did a story for The New Yorker about the primary um, the Democratic primary in, that took place in June 23rd uh, in New York, and the explosion. The president keeps happened. talking about that. Well, that's right. Yeah. I, and in fact, yeah. um, the, the press secretary, uh, Kaylee McEnany, cited my New Yorker story, which I thought is a rare example of, the, of, of my being cited by the Trump administration. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, that that it, took, it, 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 it literally took two months to count the votes, or, or yeah, yeah. well, a little, six weeks. And that was just a primary um, where, you know, there's the voting isn't as heavy as in a general election. So, so I think, you know, as Congress is trying to deal with, uh, you know, the, the, you know, one more, one more stimulus, you know, money and support for um, election processes is so indispensable because it's just going to be a very different election in terms of how the votes are cast. And, uh, to, to even you know, notwithstanding Trump's complaints, I mean, they're going these these votes are going to happen, um, the, these mail-in votes, and you know we're going to have to count them, and it's going to be difficult. Okay, with that, Jeffrey Tubin, I'm holding up your book again. It's very shiny oh, uh, against you. the light. Oh, I, uh, thank you for true crimes that. and misdemeanors: the investigation of Donald Trump. Uh, it's a great book. It's a great read, and it's it's important, I think, not only for understanding what has gone before which is always important, but understanding what lies ahead of us. Um, I will see you at some point in the hallways at CNN. When, when we return to them then, someday. When we return to importance uh, over the epi- epidemiologists, uh, Indeed. which I hope is soon, because that means that the coronavirus will be under control. Right. Um, thanks to City Arts. Thanks for letting me do this. I'm sorry we weren't there in person, but we'll do it again for your ninth book. Thanks, All right, everyone. Man. Thanks, Breed, and right. thanks to everyone at City Arts.